Welcome to the Matt Bernier Show. It's good. Welcome in the Matt Bernier Show here on DRF TV, live.drf.com, Twitter, and Facebook. As far as the daily racing forum is concerned, my name is Matt Bernier. Today is Friday, August the 11th, 2017. You can follow me on Twitter at Bernier underscore Matt. You can see right down there on the bottom of the screen. If you listen to this show podcast, you've got YouTube, SoundCloud, iTunes, video.drf.com this is a heavy weekend as far as handicapping is concerned it's also a big weekend just in general as far as horse racing is concerned because equestricon kicks off on sunday morning we will have a handicapping seminar if you've bought tickets to go up to equestricon and i don't think it's too late if you still need to get involved go to equestricon.com Find out all the details. If you're going to be up at Saratoga or in the area, you might as well go and, and hang out and have some fun, go to a bunch of different panels, all sorts of stuff. So, again, I think we kick things off. The handicapping seminar starts at 930 in the morning. There's a number of people that will be up there, and I believe it will be live on Capital OTB as well. So looking forward to that. We'll be headed up there tomorrow afternoon. But before we get to that point, let's kind of take a quick uh, look back and see what happened last weekend because there was a pretty big horse that ran in a pretty big race up at the spa named Gunrunner. He ran in the grade one Whitney, and it was one of those things where we talk about it. We saw Arrowgate a few weeks ago just completely bomb in the San Diego. People wondering, is it over for him? Has he lost a step? Is he bored? X, Y, and Z, whatever the case may be. Gunrunner, the question was, now in a race like this, would he have the opportunity to really stamp himself as a viable alternative or possibly even better than Arrowgate and he would have had to deal uh, at face value with a little bit of adversity because Luch Stables entered what appeared to be a rabbit cautious giant and there was an issue there we'll talk about that in a moment but guess what no issues for gun runner Larry Colmus with the call from the top gun runner turning for home in the Whitney in front by two on the outside breaking lucky is second keen ice has made his way up into third but he's still far behind and now florent Giroux lets gun runner go and he's opened up a four length lead breaking lucky is second keen ice on the outside is third as they come to the line gun runner wins the whitney gun runner buries the field in the whitney you can take a look at the horse card right here now this horse is over five million dollars in career earnings he's only a four-year-old he's won nine of 16 lifetime starts for steve asmussen florent Giroux, winchell and three chimneys i heard it through a little little birdie through the grapevine that they are considering and not even considering planning on running him as a five-year-old next year so we'll see what happens uh, obviously anything can go on from here uh, this horse is remarkable in the fact that it's nice to see what happens when horses really mature and start Start to come along you notice that he didn't pop to his left lead at all right there i think that was partially Giroux, partially the horse Flo didn't want to get into him didn't want to have any sort of hiccups or issues and you can take a look these are his most recent 10 races as far as uh, past performances are concerned and he's on quite a string right here uh, let's call the Dubai World Cup a 110 plus buyer that means that he has earned a 110 or better in each of his past five starts going back to last fall's Clark handicap down at Churchill Downs the interesting thing, thing, though, about these five most recent races, they are all the best of his career. Uh, not only do they coincide with him getting older and developing and maturing, but you, you can't help but notice all the ones in the PPs. And we brought up Cautious Giant. You see at the first call, he was a length behind. But Cautious Giant wasn't ridden in the sort of typical rabbit fashion where they got a half mile and 48 and change. That's not really how a rabbit is supposed to be ridden. And then the, you had the sort of fun little side story there when Gunrunner comes back. And there's a horseshoe hanging out of his tail. He wins that race for fun with five shoes, one of them not being his. He picked it up from, it looked like Cautious Giant down the backside sprung a shoe, and this horse happened to get it all tangled up in his tail. Now we get to a situation where, again, Gunrunner does what he's supposed to do, a career best number of 112 as far as buyers are concerned. Now you've got to start wondering. Next week is a big, big weekend, I think, in the overall landscape of let's just say the classic division because Arrowgate comes back in the Pacific Classic unless something unforeseen happens uh, Baffert has at least laid out the option that they could call an audible and wait for the Woodward one week later on Labor Day weekend up at Saratoga but it sounds like next weekend or I'm sorry two weeks later up at Saratoga it sounds like right now he's going to run in the Pacific Classic a mile and a quarter and he's not going to have it's not going to be a walkover you've got Accelerate who won the San Diego handicap you've got uh, Baffert Another entrant in there with Collected, who it sounds like he's training up a storm. Uh, you've got other horses in there that may be a little bit overmatched, Donworth and some other runners. But, you know, Arrowgate has the opportunity, and I still maintain, I think Arrowgate's best is better than Gunrunner's best. We don't know if we're going to get Arrowgate's best, though. If, for some reason, he stumbles 
and he stubs his toe and he doesn't rebound and get back to the good arrow gate that we know, boy, you've got to look at it and say, not only is Gunrunner the leading light as far as the Classic Division is concerned, he is a pretty prohibitive favorite, but there's also a part of me that wonders, now does that whole division become a little bit more interesting, where you're going to get some, some fresher faces, some newer faces that maybe they would be thinking races like the Dirt Mile or other year-end goals, and maybe they decide, you know what, if the big horse arrow gates out, we love, we, we try, you know, respect Gunrunner, don't get me wrong, but Jerry is out, don't know if a mile and a quarter is really his game, he's never run at Del Mar. Um, maybe all of a sudden you get some more horses that show up for a race to the Classic and it becomes more of an intriguing betting race. But one thing at a time, all we know right now, Gunrunner is the goods. He has gotten markedly better from his three-year-old campaign. He's much more professional. Steve Asmussen has done a fantastic job. And he is a, a serious, serious threat to Arrowgate as the best dirt horse in the world. Arrowgate has the opportunity next Saturday to sort of, let's say, counterpunch. He's already been punched in the face earlier this month. Now maybe he'll have an opportunity to sort of rebound here next weekend in the Pacific Classic. We're going to take a break on the show. When we come back, all handicapping the rest of the way. The middle segment's going to be all about Arlington International and our friends at Phasing Tipped in the Turf Showcase. They've sponsored all of the Arlington coverage this week. We'll go over three races there, two of them grade one variety, and then we'll come back, wrap things up with a couple of baby races, one from the Spa and one from Del Mar on Saturday. Stay with us on the Matt Bernier Show. North America's first yearling sale for horses with turf appeal is coming to Phasing Tipton. Selected yearlings by the nation's top turf sires. The Phasing Tipton Turf Showcase presented by Woodbine Racetrack, September 10th in Lexington, Kentucky. Where will you be? Luxair Jets is excited to announce the new most convenient way to fly nonstop from Lexington to historic Saratoga Springs throughout the racing meet. We are now offering exclusive group packages on our luxurious private jets. Each package offers a once in a lifetime experience that you can share with your friends, family, or business partners. Call for pricing and availability. Coming up this summer, it's Spa Babies presented by Windstar Farm. Every Wednesday through Sunday during the Saratoga meeting, Nicole Russo and I will analyze the best two-year-old races at the spa. We'll go beyond the past performances and discuss pedigree, trainer patterns, workouts, and more. It's Spa Babies presented by Windstar Farm every Wednesday through Sunday at video.drf.com. 1208 here on the east, 908 on the west coast of the Matt Bernier Show, DRFTV, live.drf.com, and the Daily Racing Forum Twitter and Facebook handles. Let's dive into some racing from Arlington International. All of the Arlington coverage this week brought to you by Phasic Tipton and the Turf Showcase. Let's dive into two grade ones and a grade three. Let's start off with the Beverly D. Older fillies and mares, I shouldn't say older fillies and mares, three-year-olds and up. Let's take a look at the field here. Uh, again, if you're new to this entire show, on the far right side of the screen, if you're watching the visuals, uh, those are my odds. What I think is fair value on each one of these runners, it's not a morning line, it's not anything else like that. It's just what I think I would need to represent fair value. The number one is Deceita for Chad Brown, one of a few in here for Chad. 8-1, to one. Prado Sweet Ride, 49-1, to one. Kittens Roar, 16-1, to one. Donna Bruja. 5 to 1, Grand Jete, 9 to 2, Zepesa, 19 to 1, Reina de Bateria, 13 to 1, Sarandia, 32 to 1, coming in from Germany as we flip over to numbers 9 and 10. Hawksmore, likely going to be forwardly placed in the Julian Leperu, 6 to 1. Rain Goddess for Aiden O'Brien and Ryan Moore, 5 to 1 odds. It's a really interesting race because you've got a number of a number of runners in here that on their best day can win a race like this. Desita is one of them. Desita at her absolute best is capable of winning this race. Um, there's a part of me that wonders if she just lost a little bit on the fastball. She's always going to be a goof with the lead changes down the lane. That part doesn't bother me so much because it is her. Um, I just do wonder a little bit, though. Maybe she's not quite as good as she has been in the past. Kittens Roar is a nice horse for Mike Maker that she just... I think she's in a little bit tough. She's run some good races. She's run tough races against really good company. And she hasn't been embarrassed. And I think you're going to get another honest effort out of her here. I just don't think she's quite as good 
is the top two or three in this spot. So she's one that I'm fading a little bit. Hawksmoor. Uh, Hawksmoor is dangerous. I'm still not convinced that distance is her friend. I know she won the New York most recently, and that was at a mile and a quarter, but she walked on the front end, and again, we've talked about it here on this show and out of the gate and anything else that we've got here on the racing form. There really isn't anyone better than Julian Leperu on the front end on turf, particularly turf, but he's very good rating paces on the lead on dirt as well. I just think uh, if you allow Leperu to get out there and dictate things, he's going to make you pay. Uh, Hawksmoor, if the distance isn't a problem for her, she's certainly a player. Rain Goddess, I don't want to say is the X factor of the race, but in a way she kind of is because we know O'Brien's had uh, tremendous history sending horses over from Europe and running in the big races over here. She's also a three-year-old facing elders. She's one for seven lifetime, but she has kept some very, very good company. Most recently, she got her doors blown off, running second behind Enable. Enable might be the best turf horse in the world. Uh, maybe I'm being a little bit overzealous there, but you look at what she did against older horses, older males, and the best males uh, in the King George, uh, just I believe at the end of July. I mean, I know it was over a bog, but she, she destroyed... Highland Real, who I know he doesn't act over that ground, but she destroyed Ulysses, she destroyed Idaho, she destroyed some really good horses, and she's a three-year-old filly. Uh, she might be the favorite for the arc before it's all said and done for John Gosden. That leads me to the two horses that I'm most interested in. One of them is Donna Bruja. Donna Bruja for Nacho Correa. She's come here to North America. She's done nothing wrong. She's two for two. She won the Modesty, and I believe, I don't remember what the race was at Churchill Downs, but she won that race as well. I, I think she is very, very good. I think there's a lot of talent here. She's never really gotten out of a gallop. So you don't know what the bottom is here. Uh, from a speed figure standpoint, she fits. She makes a lot of sense. She's won over the racetrack. Distance is only going to be her friend. Donna Bruja is my second pick in here behind my top pick. And I, I labeled her a live long shot, although I don't know how long she's going to be. I think Grand Jete visually is a horse that, that, boy, she checks all the boxes. Now, on Fig, she's a little bit light for Chad, but... Her most recent race at Belmont Park was good. She was in a little bit of traffic. She had the alter course. She beat a decent enough horse in Bar of Gold who came back to run third last weekend in the De La Rose. The race that really kind of got my ears perked up, and I think it was immediately after this race, Chad Brown said, the Beverly D is where we're going to go. We're going to take a look at the Eaton Town right now. This was down at Monmouth Park, two starts back. She's in the Godolphin, uh, Godolphin the Judmont colors. <laughs> I know, that, that, talk about Hatfields and McCoys. She's out in the clear now. She's finally hitting her stride, and she's going to go on, and she's going to finish this thing very, very nicely finishing full of run she didn't have the cleanest of trips and she still buried this field she wins by about a length and a half two lengths i understand zepesa who ran second maybe she's seen better days uh I, i'm sorry she ran third zepesa did i think grand jete though this seems to be the spot now the concern if you want to sort of look at it the opposite way is that she's not fast enough right now on time form us numbers or buyer speed figures she's just simply not fast enough she's going to need to run the best race of her life by far. Um, whether she's capable of doing it or not, I don't know. I'm I'm gambling that she is. Now keep in mind, I made her nine to two. She's six to one in the morning line. I really this is a situation where I've got to be really tight on that line because if she goes anything below four and a half to one, I, I can't touch her because of the reasons I just brought up. She's not fast enough right now to win a race like this. Donna Bruja, though, if she's in that five to one range, I could easily see myself. There's a couple of races I can say this about at Arlington on Saturday afternoon. I could easily see myself playing some sort of a Dutch and playing a couple of horses to win, just trying to eke out. You know, can I get two horses and turn them into two to one instead of having one at five to one and one at whatever else it may be? So uh, it's grand. Jete for me in the Beverly D. I like Donna Bruja as well, though. Let's move on to a million number 35 at Arlington Park. It is their marquee event. You've got a field of 13. Let's take a look at that field if we could. In post position order, the number one is Oak Brook 49 to 1, Oscar nominated 49 to 1, Enterprising 49 to 1, Ghost Hunter 49 to 1, DeVille 9 to 2 for Aiden O'Brien, Fanciful Angel 32 to 1, The Pizza Man. 49 to 1. Kasaki, 6 to 1 as we turn over 9 through 13. Scottish is out. He's scratched. He is going to be laid up for the rest of the year. They're hopeful to bring him back in Dubai in 2018. Beach Patrol, 9 to 2. Divisadero, 9 to 2. Ascend, 13 to 1. And McDowell with Frankie DeTore, my favorite, 7 to 1. This is an interesting race. Um, I think the most likely winner of the race is DeVille. 
Uh, I understand maybe his most recent race was a little bit disappointing that he didn't get the job done. Uh, keep in mind, he was carrying 138 pounds that day. And I know the horse that beat him, who's been a bit of a nibbler in the past, was carrying 135, so there's not a giant difference in weight. But he's going to come over here. He's going to get about 12 pounds off. So I, I don't think that's insignificant. And that's if they're running at 126. I don't know if it's 126, 123, whatever it may be. Um, DeVille, I think he makes a lot of sense in here. I think he. you look at his overall body of work, his worst races have come over less than firm going. It sounds like you're going to have rock hard going in Chicago on Saturday afternoon, so that shouldn't be any excuse for DeVille. He can be forwardly placed, but he doesn't need to be on the lead. I think he takes up a really good situation. Uh, but the horse that I'm going with that's a live long shot, he's 10-1 to 1 on the morning line, uh, is Kosicki. Now, Kosicki, you can make the argument he doesn't want to go this far, this mile and a quarter distance. I think he might be best at a mile and an eighth, maybe even a mile and a sixteenth. We saw in the Wise Dan two starts back at a mile on an eighth he really had a nice turn of foot finish that field off uh his most recent run in the modesty uh not the modesty arlington handicap there i am scrambled brain over here uh was good all things considered there wasn't a lot of pace signed on he had to work out a bit of a trip he was wide i think he was best that day but the race that i'm most interested in and again these two horses they both exited the most likely winner, in my opinion, DeVille and the live long shot Kosicki. They exit last year's Arlington Million. We're going to take a look at that race right now. You've got DeVille coming up now. He's in those sort of greenish silks. And now diving to the inside, you've got Kosicki in the black hat. In the black hat. He is the big gray horse splitting between uh, world approval right now and whoever the pace setter was, who I can't remember off the top of my head. But you see DeVille. Now, the other thing to keep in mind about DeVille, he was a three-year-old in this race last year. Kosicki had a dream trip. I think you're going to need to get something very similar, James Graham. Aboard Kosicki this year, if you're going to upset the apple cart, you're going to have to save some ground because, again, if he doesn't really want a mile and a quarter, last thing you want to do is be losing ground. DeVille, Ryan Moore, arguably the best rider in the world. Aiden O'Brien, arguably the best trainer in the world. Uh, I think he's the most likely winner of Arlington Million number 35. Let's move on to the day's best at Arlington Park, the pucker up. It's the nightcap. It caps off all sorts of wagers. I believe the pick five is in there, the pick four, all sorts of stuff. Let's take a look at this field. These are three-year-old fillies going about a mile and an eighth. The number one royalty princess, 99 to one. No disrespect. The number two, Fault, 13 to 1. Lipstick City for Chad Brown, 12 to 1 for Chad Brown. Journey Home, 6 to 1. Don't Mess with Joanne, 5 to 1. Sensitive, 4 to 1. Lovely Bernadette, 5 to 1. Princess La Quinta, 49 to 1. As we move over to 9 through 12, the number 9 is Katinka, 99 to 1. The 10 is Happy Mesa, 12 to 1. Canny is 32 to 1. And the 12 is Moe's MVP, 49 to to one. You'll note, again, a couple of 99 to one shots in there, not trying to be rude. I just don't think they figure very well in a race like this from for a number of reasons. Um, I have a dual most likely winner and live long shot in the pucker up. This is the horse that I'm most looking forward to on Saturday. Uh, and this is a filly named Sensitive. Sensitive making her second start for Brad Cox. Her most recent start was her first start since her two-year-old year back in October. She started last month at Ellis Park. We're going to take a look at that race right now. I understand she was running against much inferior company, but you see her right now finally hitting her stride there on the outside. She's in that yellow cap, and she's going to go on, and, and she's only going to win by about a length, maybe a half a length when it's all said and done. But I have to be honest with you, I thought this was a very, very good effort considering she was 4 or 5 path throughout. She was fanned about 9 path off the far turn. She's going to make her second start off the long layoff, her second start for Brad Cox in a race where there are no superstars whatsoever. I think everyone's going to go overboard on Chad's horse. I don't love Lipstick City. If she wins, I lose. I just don't think she's that fast right now. Highest last out buyer in the field for sensitive. The problem is, and again, this is why it's got to be a little bit of air quotes with the most likely winner. Um, sensitive is 12 to 1 on the morning line. And I also have to say live long shot, some air quotes. She's not going to be 12 to 1. I think she's probably going to be in that 4-1 to one range. I pegged her at 4-1. to one. Um, You just look at it. There are certain instances where in races that you just kind of take your papers and throw them up and whatever happens, happens. Most people are going to look at the horse with the highest last out buyer, sensitive, going to look for a horse with high-profile connections, Brad Cox. And as far as the rider is concerned, you get a Rad Ortiz Jr. I, I just There's no way that she's 12-1. to one. I'd be thrilled 
if she's half that at six, I don't think she will be. I think she'll be in that seven to two, four to one range. Uh, I also think Cox's other runner in here, the five, don't mess with Joanne. I know maybe she should have done a little bit better than she did in that Tawi at Indiana Grim, but I thought she ran quite well that day. Uh, for me, it's a Brad Cox exacta in the pucker up, but I do quite like the number six sensitive to wrap things up at Arlington International on Saturday afternoon. We're going to take a break here on the Matt Bernier Show. When we come back, we dive into two two-year-old races, one from Del Mar, one from Saratoga. The boys are going to be out on the West Coast. The girls up in Saratoga Springs. We'll talk about the Adirondack and the best pal when we come back on the Matt Bernier Show. North America's first yearling sale for horses with turf appeal is coming to Fazig Tipton. Selected yearlings by the nation's top turf sires. The Fazig Tipton Turf Showcase presented by Woodbine Racetrack, September 10th in Lexington, Kentucky. Where will you be? Luxair Jets is excited to announce the new most convenient way to fly nonstop from Lexington to historic Saratoga Springs throughout the racing meet. We are now offering exclusive group packages on our luxurious private jets. Each package offers a once in a lifetime experience that you can share with your friends, family, or business partners. Call for pricing and availability. Coming up this summer, it's Spa Babies, presented by Windstar Farm. Every Wednesday through Sunday during the Saratoga meeting, Nicole Russo and I will analyze the best two-year-old races at the spa. We'll go beyond the past performances and discuss pedigree, trainer patterns, workouts, and more. It's Spa Babies, presented by Windstar Farm. Every Wednesday through Sunday at video.drf.com. 1221 on the east, 921 on the west, the Matt Bernier Show, DRF TV. We're going to take this thing home right till 1230, and we'll lead you right in to this week's edition of Out of the Gate. But before we get to that point, let's talk about some babies. Let's talk about some two-year-old racing, huh? Shall we? Let's start off up at Saratoga. The Adirondack, it's for two-year-old fillies. This is sort of the counterpart to Sunday's main event, which is the Saratoga Special. I'll touch on that briefly when we're all done. But let's take a look at the field for the Adirondack, if we could. You've got a field of eight two-year-old fillies in this spot. You've got all the names in here. You've got Todd. You've got all the other big showcases, big people coming along. The number one is Pure Silver for Todd. Made this filly 5-1. to one. Stainless, another Todd entrant, 13-1. to one. Sly Roxy, 7-2. to two. Di Maria. Di Maria. 32 to 1. We got a soccer fan in there, and whoever owns that horse. Proportionality, 19 to 1. Limited View, 9 to 2. Wall of Compassion, 6 to 1. And Southampton Way, 6 to 1. I think this is a fascinating race because you've got some horses in here that they broke their maiden or they've only run on wet tracks, and perhaps that makes them look a little bit better than they actually are. Um, having said that, I still think that there's some talent in these fillies, and you just got to kind of. Take anything you see on a wet track with a grain of salt. I think the most likely winner of this race is a filly called Sly Roxy from Mark Cassie, I do believe. Uh, this is an interesting filly. She's shown big speed in that most recent start. She broke her maiden in her only lifetime start for Cassie and company. She got a giant wet, wet track pedigree, so it was no surprise that she took to that race. Also interesting to note that it was supposed to be run on the turf. I believe she was an MTO that day, though, so... Those are one of those things that you've always got to keep in the back of your mind. When you see that it's washed off of a, a surface, eh, very easily this could have been one of the few horses that was an MTO that happened to draw in and really relished the main track and the slop. Sly Roxy, I thought she was very, very impressive. She was bet down like a good thing down to 2-1. to one. Uh, Javier got aboard, and they went off and won by the length of the stretch. We'll find out how she handles uh, what should be fast going. Uh, I don't think there's a guarantee because it sounds like a 40-50% chance of thunder uh, tomorrow afternoon, but that's uh, par for the course. Standard Saratoga afternoon. Uh, always a chance of a thunderstorm. I think for me, she's the most likely winner in this race, but again, kind of tepid at a 7-2 to choice for me as far as odds are concerned. Uh, live long shot for me it goes out for Rudy Rodriguez. That's the seven wall of compassion. Uh, Jimmy Creed is the sire. Jimmy Creed is off to just an electric start as a sire. He was a really nice sprinter, really nice racehorse. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't get to see what he was fully capable of. The interesting thing about this Philly Wall of Compassion, uh, she was washed off the turf, 
This is a, a horse that won on a muddy track. I challenge anyone to go back and watch that replay and tell me that that was a muddy racetrack. They may have gotten rain in the morning, and then it kind of dried out because I, I didn't see any moisture whatsoever. It may have been just sort of residual stuff, but that certainly wasn't a muddy racetrack, in my opinion, anyway. Uh, I like the fact that she was off the pace a little bit. She was a little bit slow into stride, but she was out for a long, long time. It was kind of one of those... Visually, it wasn't an awesome effort, but it was one that I kind of feel like she can build off of. And if there is some pace, which again, in these two-year-old races, it always looks like you're going to get some speed signed on. Maybe she's one that can take advantage for Rudy and Angel Arroyo. I'm going to go with the seven wall of Compassion as a live long shot in the Adirondack tomorrow afternoon. Most likely winner, Sly Roxy. Let's move on to the West Coast down at the Del Mar Thoroughblood Club. It is the best pal. It's a grade two for two-year-olds. Let's take a look at that field if we could. You've got a field of eight that'll go forward. Let's start off with the number one runaway for Simon Callahan, three to one. Dia de Pago, 32 to one. Master Ruler, 24 to one. Armor Plate, 24 to one. Serengeti, three to one. Fleetwood, nine to two. Arawak, eight to one. And an Ocala, 10, nine to one for Peter Miller. Uh, I think the most likely winner of this race goes out for Bob Baffert, and that is Serengeti. We're going to take a look at Serengeti's maiden score right now. This horse was visually awesome. You see the fractions, 21 and 3. He's out there. Ears are pricked. Everybody else is off the bridle. Mike Smith is wrapped up on him at this point, and he still goes off and just buries this field. Uh, I thought this was a visually fantastic effort. This is the kind of horse that could be anything. Now, keep in mind, there was an odd thing with this horse. He debuted two weeks prior, and he was a little bit slow in stride. He pressed the pace. He ran a good enough race. He was a little bit late with the lead change. Baffert throws the blinkers on, shoves him right back into the entry box, and he goes off and does that. I think if he builds on that, he's going to be very, very tough, even with the very professional runaway. Runaway, I don't think he had any favors done to him drawing the inside there. I think Serengeti is a very, very uh, logical and likely winner of the best pal, but I'm looking for a little bit of a price. And I, you know what? Illman was giving me a hard time, but rightfully so. I always seem to gravitate toward these Keith Disormo runners, we're going to take a look at Fleetwood. Fleetwood has only raced one time, and you're going to see he's down on the inside right now in those familiar Big Chief uh, silks, and he's going to just stay on. I thought, all things considered, this was a, an educational learning experience for this horse. Taking some dirt, not always the easiest thing, breaking from the rail. The winner looks like it could be okay, even though he's hanging on the left lead. I think Fleetwood is an interesting one, especially if you look at the way this race sets up on paper. Serengeti's going to go. R uh, Runaway is going to go. Arawak figures to go. An Ocala 10 figures to go. If they all go and show some semblance of speed, I think all of a sudden Fleetwood could take a beautiful sort of stalking trip, two or three lengths off the pace. I think the additional distance going out six and a half furlongs is only going to be beneficial for him, and I think you're going to get a nice number. I made him four and a half to one. I won't be surprised if he's in that seven or eight to one range when it's all said and done for Keith and Kent Sormo. I think the most likely winner is Serengeti. My pick in my live long shot and the best pal is Fleetwood. 12.27 here on the East Coast, 9.27 on the West Coast, the Matt Bernier Show on DRF TV. Uh, I don't want to give away all of Out of the Gate, but I have to acknowledge because morning lines have come out and there have been some things. And those of you that are listening, uh, if you haven't seen Craig Milkowski's tweet already, um, those of you that have paid attention to my Twitter and have you watched Out of the Gate know that I'm a very, very big fan. I'm very high on Barry Lee. Barry Lee is going to be running Sunday in the Saratoga Special. Barry Lee... Last night, I was looking at the Time Form U.S. ratings as I was doing a little bit of handicapping. He earned a 118 in his career debut. Uh, so I sent a tweet to Craig Milkowski. I said, it's almost kind of hard to fathom. Uh, he said, no, you know, that was what he came up with. He goes, but I'm going to take a look at it again uh, today. He took a look at it. He just uh, sent me a tweet saying something along the lines of the number will come down by 12 points. So instead of it being a 118, we're looking at about a 106. Guess what? A 106 is still the fastest number in the Saratoga Special. And you had a couple of the next out winners come out of there. But I just figured anybody that's listening, if you're handicapping right now or you're going over it, uh, something to just keep in the back of your mind that the number's not quite as gaudy as it was. It's still a pretty darn strong number. And if you take a step forward, you're going to be very, very tough Sunday afternoon. Uh, Sunday afternoon, again, also opening day of EquestraCon. I think, again, I can't push this enough, not just because I'm involved in it, but... 
Um, I, I know the, the founders. I know how much time and effort they've put into this, and I really think it's going to be a fun thing. If you're in the area and you don't have tickets, go to equestricon.com. Try to get last-second stuff if you can. Um, a lot of the people are getting into town today or tomorrow and getting ready for Sunday. The first thing, we're going to kick it off. There's going to be a big panel, big seminar. Uh, a number of us, I think at least four or five of us, will be going over Sunday's card, taking some questions as well. That'll be at 930 and I believe it's open to anyone that has paid for the admission of the Monday and Tuesday uh, situation. It's an add-on as far as EquestriCon is concerned. It is 1229 here on the East Coast. If you want to follow me on Twitter, you can see it right there, at Bernier underscore Matt. Uh, if you watch this thing live, noon Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific, every Friday, occasionally because of scheduling, uh, maybe taped or whatever it may be. But again, it streams live.drf.com livestream.com and the daily racing forums twitter and facebook pages if you check it podcast youtube soundcloud itunes video.drf.com and you know what i i find it interesting that we've got a pretty even spread some of you catch this thing on live.drf.com some of you catch it on youtube some of you catch it on our homepage on, on video.drf.com some of you listen to the podcast whether it's soundcloud or itunes uh however you do it thank you for doing so thank you for bearing with us again we've got some stuff coming up as we get toward the end of saratoga and del mar this show is going to have a bit of a different look and i don't want to totally break it just yet but we may be expanding a little bit. So uh, look for that here in the next three to four weeks. Uh, we'll be putting some finishing touches on things. Next week, I will be going out to Del Mar for the Pacific Classic. I still don't know my travel situation just yet, so I don't know if it'll be an abbreviated show. I don't know if it'll be a full show, whether I'll be here, I'll be in California at an airport. I have no idea. Stay tuned. We'll be ready to go, though, again next Friday, noon Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific. Uh, without further ado, best of luck this weekend, wherever you're playing, whatever you're playing, however you're playing. Let's throw it in.